Welcome back to Biotechniques on Catalyst University. My name is Kevin Tokoff. Please make sure to like this video and subscribe to the channel for future videos and notifications. In the previous few videos, we've been talking a lot about uh, DNA techniques. Now we're going to shift a little bit more into protein work, which is also an aspect of molecular biology and biochemistry. Specifically here, we're going to talk about SDS page. SDS page is a method for separating proteins in a gel. So in one of the previous videos, we talked about separation of DNA molecules, and this is with what's called an agarose gel. If we're separating proteins, we have to use a different kind of gel. This is called a, an SDS page gel. SDS stands for sodium dodecyl sulfate. This is a molecule that we're going to see the function of later, but in any case, what it's going to do is help denature the proteins, which we want. And then the page stands for polyacrylamide gel electrophoresis. So gel electrophoresis, that's just the separation on a gel. Polyacrylamide is actually the substance, the matrix of the gel itself. In DNA gels, the matrix was agarose. There's no agarose in protein gels, it's polyacrylamide. But it's everything else is pretty much the same principle, except there's a little bit more uh, complication in proteins, so let's talk about that. Here we have some general, what we call native protein structures. Native protein structure means that it's folded, all the correct interactions are there. It basically has its tertiary or we can say quaternary structure in some cases. And those structures are caused by one, disulfide bridges, such as this sulfur-sulfur bond that are from two cysteine residues that are actually covalently bound. That helps the protein fold and give it structure, but we also have non-covalent interactions such as ion-ion charges, like the negative charge of, for example, an aspartate residue with the lysine residue, which has a positive charge. Those positive-negative interactions are going to help fold the protein, and if we're separating them, we need to get rid of those somehow, both the disulfide bridges or bonds and these non-covalent interactions. Okay. Now, there's really three things we're going to have to do generally to cause these proteins to denature completely. One of them is not mentioned here, and that's we have to heat the sample. Um, we're going to heat the sample because, remember, heat causes um, the proteins to unfold. It denatures the proteins. But that's not going to accomplish it completely. What we're also going to have to do is add sodium dodecyl sulfate, or SDS. Now, um, Here's a molecule. This is actually sodium dodecyl sulfate. It's actually a sulfate, and on one of these oxygens, you have a fatty acid chain. Uh, that's the dodecyl part of it. It's 12 carbons. And then notice the sulfate has a negative charge on it. It does have a sodium here, but we don't care about that. But this is sodium dodecyl sulfate. Here's a folded protein, and what happens is when you heat the protein with SDS, you get a situation like this, where the protein in yellow right here completely unfolds into more of a linear, uh, a linear form. And these fatty acid tails of each SDS molecule, that's this part right here, the fatty acid tail is very hydrophobic. And it actually will bind to a protein's hydrophobic amino acid residues, examples being the aromatics like phenylalanine, tyrosine, tryptophan, in branch chain amino acids like leucine, isoleucine, and valine. Um, because remember, those amino acids do not like to be exposed to the external watery environment, but if you coat them in this fatty portion of the SDS molecule, which is also hydrophobic, you can actually stabilize um, their exposure. Not to mention, uh, this sulfate, which will be on the outside, has a negative charge, which can interact with the water outside. And so ultimately what you do is you allow this protein to completely unfold as shown like this because the hydrophobic residues are bound to, or at least interacting with the hydrophobic acyl chain of the SDS molecule. And then the sulfates are all on the exterior and they allow this entire entity right here to interact with the watery environment. That allows it to be soluble while at the same time completely unfolded and denatured. That's very important and we'll come back to this negative charge thing in a minute. The other thing is we have to add what's called 2 mercapta ethanol or sometimes also called beta mercapta ethanol. This is a chemical that will actually reduce all the disulfide bonds, meaning it will take these sulfur-sulfur covalent bonds from two cysteine residues and basically reduce them, so that means separate them. So that means these sulfurs are no longer bound together. That will cause uh, more of the tertiary structure to fall apart and then you'll completely get something like this. Really all three of those things generally are necessary in order to cause complete denaturation of the protein. Now here's the important thing about adding the SDS. 
Notice how all these SDS molecules completely coat this protein, okay? That helps to solubilize it in its unfolded form, but it does something else. Even though the protein itself has both negative and positive charges, let's say the negatives are from like glutamate, aspartate, the positives are from let's say lysine, arginine, and so forth, even though it's a mixture of positive and negative charges, by putting all these negative charges on the surface, you essentially make every single protein negatively charged. And the bigger the protein is, the more SDS molecules will bind. In other words, the bigger the protein is, or the longer this chain is, the more negative charges there will be. So if I were to cut this protein in half, let's say, it's going to be half its length, it's going to have half the number of SDS molecules and half the number of negative charges. So in other words, the bigger the protein is, the more negative charges it's going to have from the SDS molecules. And so in other words, the bigger the protein is, the more negatively charged it's going to be. And so we have what's approximately now a constant mass to charge ratio. So a bigger protein is going to have more negative charge. A smaller protein will have less negative charge. And that's going to be important in the actual electrophoresis. Let's actually go into that now. Our SDS page gel is going to look, and the apparatus itself is going to look a little bit different than the DNA gel. DNA gels typically run horizontally, though you can lay them flat on a table, um, and the apparatus runs horizontally. SDS page gels run vertically, um, but it's going to function in much the same way, except for the matrix here is going to be uh, polyacrylamide. Um, you're going to have a different running buffer. The running buffer, unlike in this case, which was TBE or TAE, depending, this one's actually going to be an SDS-based uh, buffer. Um, we won't get into that too much. But again, you're going to have to boil the sample. I really should say heat. It's not really boiling, but it's heating with SDS and tumor cap to ethanol. And then you're going to load those samples and a marker into these, into these wells, very similarly to the way we did it in a DNA gel. We have one of these uh, wells, or, or more than one in some cases, that has a ladder. Then the other samples go into the other wells. Okay, Very much the same. And then you're going to electrophoresis it. And what's going to happen is you're going to separate the proteins based on their on their charge, which is directly related to their mass now, now that they're covered in SDS molecules. Remember, bigger molecule, bigger proteins have more negative charge. Again, in the same way as in a DNA gel setup, we have a negative electrode up here at the top, which emits a negative electric field. We have a positive electrode down here that emits a positive electric field. So if we have a protein that is negatively charged completely because it's surrounded in SDS molecules, then they're going to migrate down towards the positive electrode because, one, they're attracted to the positive charge here, negative, positive, but they're also repulsed by this negative electric field up at the top. So all proteins now will run downwards, at least in this case, and really in the setup they run down towards the bottom. Another thing that's also very similar to the DNA gel is the bigger the protein is, the higher the molecular weight, the, the less distance it's going to migrate. Again, that has to do with the size, and we talked about a couple of examples of this. Um, you can, one, think about it scientifically as Newton's second law in action. If you have a molecule, like a protein like this, with a bigger mass, it's going to accelerate more slowly because you're applying the same amount of electric force, the same amount. So with a constant force, a bigger mass is going to accelerate more slowly. A smaller mass is going to accelerate more quickly and therefore it's going to migrate further. But another conceptual way to think about it is the high molecular weight, this is like a semi truck, the low molecular weight is your little car. Which is going to accelerate more quickly, the car or the semi truck? Well it's obviously going to be the car. Semi trucks are much bigger, they, take, they accelerate much more slowly. Again, another example would be if you went up on the track in the gym and ran one lap as fast as you could with a five pound dumbbell, you're probably going to run more quickly than you do if you run the same lap with a 50 pound dumbbell. Again, you're weighed down more in the 50 pound dumbbell case so you accelerate more slowly and therefore you may not run as far in the same amount of time. So smaller proteins migrate further, larger proteins do not migrate as far. Very important key. When this gel has finished electrophoresing and you're satisfied with it, 
um, what you're generally going to do is pull it out and visualize it with a stain. So initially, you won't see any of this. You won't see any proteins there. It'll be just a blank gel for the most part. You actually have to add a stain, and two of the common ones that, uh, there's others as well, but are amido black and kumasi blue. Uh, this one is stained with kumasi blue, and so every protein in each of these lanes, including the latter, is stained blue because of the kumasi blue. If you stain with the mito black, it'll more or less come out either kind of a very dark purple to black. Um, but this allows you to see where the proteins are. Okay, and if all you're doing is just checking to see if there's proteins there, then that's pretty much uh, you're pretty much done. Um, and you can, you can actually take pictures of this with some kind of imager, or if it's strong enough image, you can just take a picture with your phone, honestly. But um, what you can do from here, and we'll talk about this in a separate video, is you can proceed to a second part of an experiment, where now that you've separated the proteins, you can proceed to what's called a western blot. So western blotting is a way of, instead of seeing all the proteins, there's probably hundreds of proteins here you can see just one protein because there may be only one protein of interest that you care about. In this first lane especially, there might be, I mean, there may not be a hundred, but there might be 50 there. There's a lot, okay? Suppose this one right here that's really bold in each of these lanes, that's the only one I care about. I don't want all this stuff down here. So if I just want to see this one right here, this big bold band near the top, I would do what's called a western blot. And the western blot is going to be the topic of uh, the next video, and we will uh, discuss that um, in the next video. So join us there, but hopefully in this video it, I gave you a good understanding of SDS page, um, how we prepare the sample and what the purpose of each general reagent is, and then also what happens when we separate the protein. Another thing I'm going to mention very quickly before we conclude is that if you really wanted to identify the exact molecular weight of each of these uh, proteins in your samples, um, you would have to construct a standard curve um, uh, based on the molecular weight ladder as shown right here. Um, I don't have the weights listed here. I don't know what they are off the top of my head, but you would have to construct a standard curve very similar to what we did after the gel electrophoresis video where we can identify the number of base pairs per band. You can do the same same thing in a protein gel, an SDS page gel, construct a standard curve to figure out exact uh, molecular weights of these proteins. We'll do that in a separate video, so watch for that. But in the next video, we're actually going to talk about the Western blot. Please make sure to like this video and subscribe to my channel for future videos and notifications. Thank you.